Gene Sperling, uh, the director of the White House Economic Council, is on the line right now. Mr. Sperling, good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Well, us. we're tickled to have you. And let me just say, I want, I want to start off by asking, why should unemployment benefits be extended? Uh, I mean, it was never intended to be a permanent solution. Uh, the, uh, the jobless rate is looking a lot better these days. At some point, don't you have to say to the American people, this was never an endless well? Never intended to be that. So uh, let's start uh, returning things back to normal. Sure, absolutely. That is exactly the way uh, emergency unemployment benefits are designed. They are designed to be temporary. And what, it, what, what we have done, and we've done this for over a half a century right now, is when the unemployment rate is particularly high, you give extra weeks, particularly in those areas that are facing longer t- term unemployment. So to use a word that's popular in the Fed these days, law, uh, emergency unemployment is designed to taper off as the empo- unemployment rate comes down. But it's coming down, isn't it? It is, except I'll give t- t- a couple things. One, 7% is, would still be a very unusually high rate to cut benefits off. And here's the most important factor. We have never cut benefits off when long-term unemployment has been even uh, more than half as high as it is now. So in other words, we're about twice as high right now in terms of long-term employment. What I mean is people who've experienced unemployment for six months or longer than we've been any other time we've cut it off. And the reason that's important is that implies that 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 people are having trouble finding these jobs who've been unemployed for six months or longer, not because they're not trying hard enough, but because there's some real systemic and more difficult problems in the workforce. And all this does is say, let's extend it for another year. Let's not make this moment when we have historically high long-term unemployment, the moment that we just cut 1.3 million families off, just cut them off cold, and when? between Christmas and New Year's? Well, here's the thing that I, that I have a hard time with. At one point, you say, look, the unemployment rate is going down. It's now at 7%. That's a, that's a big improvement over where it was. But on the other hand, you say, that number's really not true, though, because there are a lot of people who are not registered in that number. Yeah, you really can't have it both ways, can you? No, I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm still talking about the people who are registered in that number, because to be counted as unemployed, in affecting the unemployment rate, you still have to be actively looking for work. So these are people who've been out of work for six months or longer, but they're still out there every day looking for a job. In fact, you can't get the emergency unemployment benefits unless you're actively out there looking for a job. So remember, these are not the people who, these aren't people who were, you know, putting together subprime uh, complex uh, uh, (laughs) securitizations. They, They didn't choose to have a, a great recession. They didn't choose to have a legacy of that being that even as the economy is recovering, it's still tough for some people. Uh, look, yeah. you know, l- let's just look right now. There's bipartisan legislation that says let's just extend it for three months. Now, why is there bipartisan legislation? Why did a Republican senator decide to uh, uh, co-sponsor this with Jack Reed, a Democrat from Rhode Island? Well, probably because he's a senator from Nevada that's facing over 9% unemployment. And he's looking out and he's seeing people who've worked their whole lives. They're looking hard to find a job. Uh, They're desperate to find a job to support their family. And they know that if they just cut that off now, that's not going to help that person find a job. No, it sure won't. That's going to mean that's going to mean that they're in a very desperate situation, uh, you know, just just without even a lifeline to support their children. Gene Sperling is our guest. He's the director of the president's White House Economic Council. And and uh, this listen, the unemployment extension. It's it's a twofold question. It's an, there there are economic reasons uh, to extend it, but there's also a philosophical issue here. And I'd love to ask you from the philosophical point of view, uh, why should they? end unemployment benefits at all. I mean, why, why should there be a cutoff? I mean, you talk about these people who have been looking for work for six months. Uh, you know, if the unemployment rate goes down to 4%, that doesn't help the person who falls in between the gap. I mean, they may be part of that 4%, and they may be, have been unemployed looking for work for over two years. Why are you cutting off that person's benefits as well? Shouldn't this just be open-ended forever? Look, these are all difficult questions, but the basic idea over the last half century with emergency unemployment is that when unemployment 
you know, is, is at a fairly low level, when we're near full employment, there's an assumption that people may be unemployed for a few months as they look for a new job. No, but but there are people who are unemployed for much longer, and then transition. those benefits get cut off. Why don't you want to help those people, too? Why do we cut off unemployment benefits at all, philosophically? Philosophically, I think that we have to draw. I mean, you know, one of the difficult things in public policy is drawing lines somewhere so that you don't have uh, any negative. So you agree there does have to be a line drawn. The only question here is where you. So you draw the line at one place, and the conservatives that you're uh, battling on the House and in the Senate, they draw the line another place. But both sides here do want to cut off unemployment benefits. Both of you want to see people fall through the cracks. Uh, of course, I don't want to see anybody fall through the cracks, and we support uh, various different measures. We have a Pathways to Work initiative. We have many initiatives to help people who face very long-term unemployment or serious problems facing jobs. But what we are talking about right now is at least a sense of precedent. What have we done over the last 50 years? Over the last 50 years, there, there's really only been one time when you've cut off emergency unemployment benefits right. uh, when you've been at, at 7% unemployment, and you've never cut it off before okay. when you face yeah. no, you're right. long-term Absolutely. unemployment. So you're right. I mean, you can always have a philosophical debate of what more we should be doing. And, and I'll be honest, we face a greater challenge of long-term unemployment in our yeah. country. So beyond long-term unemployment benefits, which we should be cutting off now at this rate. We as a country are going to have to do more over the next few years to make sure that we don't have members of our, of our communities, our neighbors, our relatives facing long-term unemployment of over one and a half, two years, because what studies show is when you're unemployed for that long, you don't, it's very hard to ever fully recover. So this is one step. This is a lifeline for people who are out there looking for work. But I will say, in the aftermath of the Great Recession, we as a country, and that means policymakers, it also means business leaders and people who hire, are going to have to make an extra effort to give people who've been long-term unemployed uh, a fair chance to All get right. back in the workforce. Gene, you, you joined us a little late, and we had a few more questions. Do you mind? We just have to tell the people how great the traffic is out there for a minute, and then we'll can, can you stay can with you us? Hang for a minute? Yeah, sure. Great. We really appreciate it. Gene Sperling is back. Mr. Sperling, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Sorry we lost you there for a second. No problem. All right, so here's my question. It has to do with Obamacare. Uh, we, you know, it has really not been a tremendously good rollout. I think even you would agree that. Uh, a lot of people are saying that, you know, look, this, this is really turning out to be redistribution of wealth. Everything that we're hearing right now coming from Democrats and from this administration has to be income and equality. We need, we need to a ask the rich for a little more so the poor can do a little better. At some point, don't we reach a point where you can't go to the rich to solve the problems? of this country? Uh, you know, first of all, uh, you're right, no question. Uh, uh, you know, the President said our bad on some of the errors in the rollout of, of the Affordable Care Act, but as today is the, the, the second day of it going into effect, I think that uh, it's important to recognize right now that today there are going to be six million people already who will be covered because of Obamacare. How many people lost their insurance as a result of Obamacare? Very few. Very few. Right. There's, a, there's a ways and means study right now that's suggesting that's, in, 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 you know, relatively small numbers. Uh, there are 900,000 that we know of just in California. And I've seen a report from ABC News that says four to five million have lost their insurance because of the regulations from the Department of Health and Human Services. The uh, Look, I think when you look at people who either were... Uh, either able to get uh, uh, new, I mean, renew their coverage, who were canceled, they were able to renew their coverage, or they were able to go into the uh, exchange and get subsidies. Uh, uh, you find that either the special extensions we've done, the grandfathering, the ability to uh, that we offered to renew programs left a very small number. And I think it is time to start appreciating that, you know, the reason we haven't had this kind of health care security in our country forever is not is because it's hard, not because it's not important. Well, I understand. And as we it make this transition, what, let's, let's recognize some of the positive things that 
that happened. We've now seen 2.1 million Americans sign up for the exchange. For all the bad news in October, there's been very good news recently. Things but, but have been Gene, working. Gene. People have been. And what's that going to mean going forward? What do you say, though, to the people out there? There's a story out there today talks about people who, who are just making enough money to not get the subsidy. They might be in their 50s or their 60s, and they're finding that the premiums are costing them 20% of their entire income. What do you say to those people? What do you say to the people who are finding that their income uh, is being severely uh, impacted by the fact that they're paying a lot more for, for health care that didn't meet the standards of what they already had? I think what, what we, you will find is for tens of millions of Americans already, this is providing enormous benefits for every American family. You can on no the backs longer, just of like the this, people who make can no lot. longer be discriminated against because of a pre-existing benefit. There are millions of Amer- tens and tens of yeah, millions I, of Americans who've already benefited. Tens of millions of Americans who've benefited from better prescription drugs. But and but and Gene, every American, including you and I, from now on, will not ever have to go to bed with the fear that you are one pink slip and one illness away but from there, financial devastation. But the people who are reaping the benefit of this, and there are some, are people who are, are, are doing so on the backs of people who have been successful in life. In other words, once again, we take well, just, from the I rich could, to, I to, couldn't, to help I couldn't the poor. I could disagree with you more. What this does is provide an opportunity for us to have a more rational system. So you don't think there's any, any kind of income redistribution uh, imagined in Obamacare? No, I think this is about providing one of the basic forms of security for families that's been missing in this country and has caused unbelievable heartbreak for families who've lost health care, who couldn't get health care, who've been denied health care because someone in their family uh, had a pre-existing condition. Mm -hmm. And we now have a system to deal with that. And you know what? There's going to be some bumps in the road. There's a reason why FDR and Truman and Clinton and others had troubles doing it. But right now we're implementing something that's going to be very important. And I have no question in my mind. I have to go now. I have no question that 20 years from now people will look back at this like they look at Medicare and Social Security and they'll hear there were bumps in the road, but they won't be able to believe that there was a time when families uh, could be without health insurance just because they were at the wrong place at the wrong time or that a child was born uh, uh, with an illness or pre-existing condition. Thank you, Gene Sperling. You did a great job advocating for your position. Hopefully you'll come back uh, more often. We love having these exchanges with the White House. Thank you, sir. It's 7.24. He's got a very busy schedule. Really, really great. Very nice.